All right, welcome to the Fort Hall Forum at Suffolk University. I'm Jennifer Bernardi, the Executive Director of the Fort Hall Forum, where the speakers enlighten the audience and the audience challenges the speakers. Thank you for joining us tonight uh, at our debate between free trade and fair trade entitled Trade-Offs, Can Free Be Fair? Uh, before we begin, first I'd like to say um, I got the speaker's coffee and so Dunkin' Donuts has no bearing on uh, their arguments tonight. Um, Dunkin' Donuts is neither free nor fair and anything you see these people imbibe is my fault. Uh, I already got admonished for serving water in plastic bottles at the environmental forum And I just, from here on in, would like to apologize for any and all beverages you might see at the Ford Hall Forum. <laughs> we are cheap and have no scruples. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank the Forum's generous sponsors, Altria, the Lowell Institute, uh, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and the sponsors of our First Amendment Award last week, uh, including Choate Hall and Stewart, Plymouth Rock, Prince Lobel, Ropes and Gray, Wilmer Hale and WBUR. We especially want to thank our partner, Suffolk University, which provides the Fort Hall Forum with access to countless services, including use of this room. Uh, we also thank our esteemed members, without whom we could not put on these free public events. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Jeff Jacoby. Jeff Jacoby has been a board member of the Fort Hall Forum since 2004 and an op-ed columnist for the Boston Globe since 1994. Seeking a conservative voice, the Globe hired him away from the Boston Herald, where he had been chief editorial writer since 1987. Known as the region's preeminent spokesman for conservative nation, Jacoby has been an attorney at Baker and Host Hostletter, an assistant to BU President John Silber, a political commentator for WBUR, and the host of weekly TV program Talk of New England. He was the first recipient of the Brindell Prize, a $10,000 prize for excellence in opinion, of, in, I'm sorry, in opinion journalism, and has received the Thomas Paine Award of the Institute for Justice, presented to journalists who dedicate their work to the preservation and championing of individual liberty. Please give a big hand for Jeff Jacoby. Thank you, Jen. Next time I'm bringing my own mug to pour the water into. I don't want to get in any trouble with the Environmental Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My thanks to all of you for being here tonight. Before we begin, I, I had thought Jen might mention it. Uh, those of you who carefully scrutinize the, um, the Fort Hall Forum brochure uh, may be expecting a pair of uh, panelists tonight. Indeed, you've got a pair of panelists tonight, but it's not quite the pair that we were expecting. Uh, as you will hear in a moment, one of our expected guest speakers tonight, Don Boudreau of uh, George Mason University, was stranded in Washington, D.C., could not get a flight out despite spending hours at uh, National Airport today. Uh, at the last minute, uh, we have a distinguished uh, substitute from right here at Suffolk University. Uh, so those of you who came here specifically to, to meet and hear and see Don Boudreau, uh, please stay anyway. We're going to give you a good show. A few months ago, the NBC Wall Street Journal poll put this question to 1,000 Americans. In general, do you think that free trade between the United States and foreign countries has helped the United States, hurt the United States, or has not made much of a difference either way? The results were striking. 23% of the respondents said free trade had helped. 23% said it hadn't made any difference at all. And 47%, a little more than the other two combined, said that it had hurt. But a year earlier, a similar question asked by the CBS New York Times poll had elicited a very different response. That question was, on balance, do you think trade with other countries, both buying and selling products, is good for the US economy, or is it bad for the US economy? That time, 23% of respondents said it was bad, while 66%, nearly three times as many, said it was good. International trade is one of those subjects on which almost everyone has an opinion, very often an emotional opinion. But what that opinion is and what it's based on can be very hard to pin down. In 1993, some of you will remember this, when the Clinton administration was fighting to win Senate ratification of the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA. 
Ross Perot was leading the fight to defeat it. On November 9 that year, Perot and then Vice President Al Gore famously debated the issue on the Larry King Show. It was one of King's highest rated shows ever. He later said that it was the most influential show he had ever, hired, he had ever hosted. More than 16 million Americans tuned in to watch. The debate lasted 90 minutes. It was intense. Going into the debate, polls showed that 34% of Americans said that they supported NAFTA. When the debate was over, support for the free trade agreement had jumped to 57%. Not long thereafter, it was ratified in the US Senate, and President Clinton said that what had turned the debate around was the debate on the Larry King Show. In his debate with Ross Perot that night, Al Gore said that free trade was the economic key to optimism, hope, and change. The president in the White House today, whose campaign slogan was hope and change, has called trade a cornerstone of our growth and global development, but he says its benefits, benefits must also be shared more equitably and that we will not be able to sustain this growth if it favors the few and not the many. President Obama issued a call for not just free trade, but what is called fair trade, for looking not only at dollars and cents when trade takes place between countries, but at disparities in pay and working conditions, at practices like child labor, at the exploitation of small farmers, at environmental despoliation. The problem, and I think it will become more apparent as our forum t unfolds tonight, is that fair trade is a term with no universally agreed meaning. Some who speak of fair trade mean mandatory restrictions on imports from other countries in order to benefit workers in this country. Others who speak of fair trade have in mind voluntarily paying more for imports sold here in order to benefit workers and those who produce the, those imports overseas. Champions of free trade, on the other hand, argue that there is generally no better way of increasing prosperity for the greatest number of people than allowing willing buyers and willing sellers to trade without interference. Interference from tariffs, interference from subsidies, interference from restrictions, interference from politics. So, free trade, fair trade, both. I hope that our program tonight will shed some light on a topic that has been roiling American politics literally for centuries. Benjamin Franklin, more than 250 years ago, was involved in debates about the question of free trade. With that introduction, let me introduce our guest speakers. At the left end of the table, Rodney North is the former chairman and currently the vice chairman of Equal Exchange, an organization launched in Massachusetts 25 years ago to market fair trade coffee, tea, cocoa products, and other goods. Equal Exchange describes its mission on its website, and by the way, I didn't know until I looked up the website that there is uh, what do they call it, domain extension of co-op. I never knew that. Equalexchange.coop is the, the website. And on that website, the, the group describes its mission as building long-term trade partnerships that are economically just, environmentally sound, and mutually beneficial, and that contribute thereby to a more equitable and democratic world. A 15-year veteran of the fair trade movement, Mr. North received his undergrad degree in international development economics, and he completed his senior thesis on the effects of NAFTA in Nova Scotia. Our other speaker tonight, who very graciously agreed to step in just a few hours ago when, as I mentioned, Don Boudreau was unable to get in here from Washington, is David Turk, professor of economics here at Suffolk University and chairman of the economics department since 1982. He is also the executive director of the Beacon Hill Institute for Public Policy Research, a think tank that describes itself on its website as grounded in the principles of limited government, fiscal responsibility, and free markets, and which Dr. Turk founded 20 years ago. He has also taught at the University of Illinois at Chicago at California State College and at my alma mater, George Washington University. Dr. Turk is the co-author of two books on trade policy and he has written, edited, or overseen countless reports and studies on 
fiscal and economic issues of all kinds. The plan for tonight, very simply, is for each of our guests to take a few minutes to briefly lay out his thoughts on the pros and cons of the question of free trade or fair trade. I will then follow up with some questions and some conversation. And then, as always, at about, uh, well, that clock is wrong, isn't it? Is it? It's an hour off. At about 7.15, uh, as always, we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. And so with that, let me thank you all again for being here and invite Rodney North to take the mic. Thank you all very much for coming and thank you to the Ford Hall Forum for having me here. And First of all, I want to make sure that it's clear that my emphasis will be to talk about voluntary fair trade. That is a, a, a set of voluntary practices that we, Equal Exchange, uh, engage in and our customers, stores, cafes, uh, uh, church congregations and others engage in. It's all voluntary. There's no, uh, it's not uh, coerced. There's no government regulation. Nobody is obliged to or forced to take part or to conduct trade the way we, that we are. Uh, but first, let me say that I'm a businessman. I'm one of the 100 owners of Equal Exchange, a for-profit tax-paying entity. And we've been doing this for 25 years. We use trade as a positive tool to change the lives of poor farmers. We work with all kinds of farmers in all parts of the world. We've seen up close and in detail how both regulated and free trade has brought advantages and troubles for our farmer partners. And like all of us, I live in a world that is increasingly characterized by freer and freer trade in goods and services. And at Equal Exchange, we, of course, we make our living as traders. We import and occasionally export over 10 million pounds of coffee, tea, and bananas every year. It is always on a fair trade basis, and most of the time, but not always, it is also done in a free trade situation. But we do sometimes deal with a variety of government-imposed trade barriers both here and abroad. And I mention, this is, I mention this because the point is our opinions come directly from daily experience. They are not theories, they are observations. So I'm going to put the emphasis on what happens with coffee. That, that is the best known fair trade product. It is what we're best known for. And I would emphasize that coffee markets historically and today are neither free nor fair. The textbook images of how markets are supposed to work simply do not apply in the coffee industry. The coffee industry we know best uh, in Central America and Latin America was frankly born in violence over the last 150 years. And then since then, it has been sustained by violence and economic force and coercion ever since. So as a for, as a for instance, in Central America, in the early years of the Central American republics in 1820s, 30s, 40s, 50s. It was frankly a power play by the elites in those areas, the, the large landholders, merchants, and uh, government leaders, to force some people to work for other people, to take land from those who had had it, to compel them to become laborers on these large plantations. The state-sanctioned violence was used to make this labor freely available, so to speak, uh, for the plantation owners and the large coffee exporters. And since then, we have seen pretty much on a regular basis over the generations, a, 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 the same cycle of coercion and force being used. And the bigger point, and, and this, you can look at the La Mantanza, the massacre of tens of thousands of indigenous people in El Salvador, uh, at the behest of the ruling elite as a way to try to reinforce the, the status quo uh, in the ec economy there, which is coffee dominated. And the, the bigger point, and I can give you more recent examples, is that uh, it would be Pollyannish to, th to imagine a textbook example of how uh, markets work. And in the founding era of equal exchange 25 years ago, we realized that uh, something had to be done and that the, the situation of the small-scale farmers and everybody they dealt with was basically the, the vestige of a fixed game and that it would take more than just normal market mechanisms which had perpetuated 
this inequality to change that. And so we voluntarily said, okay, even though the market compels us to act in a certain way, we are not going to do that. Um, the market encourages one to simply follow price signals, to buy low and sell high. And one of the issues about the market, and we'll talk about it more tonight, is that the basically markets respond well to money and not so much to people. And that the, the weaker you are, the, the less money you have, the less resources, the less opportunities, the less information, the more the market squeezes you and the less it serves you. Uh, so maybe not surprisingly, uh, over the generations in ver these very lopsided uh, economies like in Central America, the market was working very well for a very small number of people and the market was working very badly for a very large number of people. Uh, one thing that we often hear is, well, if markets are, if, if coffee farming, for example, leads to a perpetuation of misery and poverty generation after generation, people should simply do something else. You know, if we have a bad job, we go looking for a better one. And that is not a realistic expectation in these areas. Um, the farmers are often in very remote areas. Um, their land is good for a few things, not for everything. Um, they themselves have what are called sunk costs for generations. They may have been growing coffee. They've built up the infrastructure for it. They have an orchard, which may be 50 years old. It is good for growing coffee. It is not good for growing uh, soybeans or s strawberries uh, or something else. Um, and I can elaborate on this more, but the point of it, if you would, you know, we've been doing this for 25 years, that these farmers, as badly as the market normally serves them, they are making rational choices. That uh, often coffee farming, or it could be cacao or banana farming, as badly as it pays is often economically the most rational choice for them. And we at Equal Exchange and other f fair traders are saying, while the market is encouraging us to, to buy low and to pay you as little as possible, which we know which would perpetuate your poverty and your economic disadvantage, we're simply not going to do that. Um, and it is, it is really doing business on the practice, on, on the principle of the golden rule. All of the great uh, religions, and certainly the Judeo-Christian religions, make the point over and over again not to press your economic advantage to its fullest whether it could be the Jubilee year in, in the Old Testament that talks about every seven years, free your slaves, forgive debts, um, you know, pay workers uh, that day, don't make them wait. Uh, d and in so many words, it is to, to listen to that human feeling that we have. Uh, in markets, we'll talk about that the that it, it perfectly makes sense to, to, to act on your senses. Oh, this tastes better, I'll pay more for it. This perfume smells better, I'll pay more for that. Um, but also, what about, okay, this leather, it feels great. Well, how about the, like the emotional feeling? Uh, think about that sense. And in a way, fair trade is acting on, on that sense, which is doing this feels better than doing that. We would rather make informed choices. Um, we think there's more than enough money to go around and we will, and the people who in turn buy our products, we will voluntarily engage in a kind of redistribution. Um, there's enough money here in the, say, North American coffee market and the North American cafe scene. There's very little money there in rural areas of Guatemala, Peru, Tanzania. And we're gonna try to get more of that money there. And it'll be on a voluntary basis. We're not making anybody do anything. Um, but it feels right. And we know that it's economically viable. As I was telling Jeff earlier, uh, we've been doing this for now 25 years. We've grown for 25 years. We've been profitable and paying taxes for 22 of the last 23 years. And the idea has caught on. Um, for whatever we may have said about Dunkin' Donuts, their espresso is now fairly traded. Many Fortune 500 companies have now adopted, at least in small part, fair trade practices. The fair trade market is now a billion dollar market in the United States, um, and it's growing by leaps and bounds every year. So it's economically viable, it makes a substantial difference in the countryside, and it feels right. 
So we'll have more time to get into that, and I'll leave my comments there for now. Great. Thank you very much, Rodney North. David Turk. Uh, thank you, Jeff, and um, thank the Ford Hall Forum for allowing me to participate in this prestigious series of lectures uh, for which I'm sure I'm not qualified. But uh, I guess uh, any old economist is better than nothing when Don Boudreau can't get out of Virginia, so I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I wrote up some notes in which I intended to do mortal combat with the first speaker uh, because I um, based in part on the... Um, uh, what might have been a misconception before I talked to him about what he's all about. I, I am still uh, strongly in disagreement with much of what he just said, and I will point out that when uh, Jennifer brought the coffee, I insisted that it would be unfairly treated coffee. <laughs> the, uh, my quarrel uh, with Rodney is uh, not about his business practices. He's uh, free to make money or to engage in whatever altruism he enjoys engaging in, if that's what it is. My quarrel with him is what I consider to be false labeling. Uh, I will argue shortly that there is nothing particularly fair about fair traded coffee or fair traded anything. In fact, the whole concept of fair trade is, uh, is uh, in, a, in a sense, um, uh, I would have to almost use the word reprehensible because of, of its misleading character. Uh, if I, I am chairman of economics, I have limited power in my department, but I, I'm thinking about instituting a requirement that any student that ever writes the expression fair trade on an exam will be automatically flunked from the course. Just because, just because of the way that phrase is frequently used in many instances to uh, deceive people into adopting and supporting protectionist trade policies, and in this instance, I, I believe, into paying more for coffee because of some feel-good feeling they get from it, uh, whereas, in fact, I see nothing fair about what's going on. But let me go back to some fundamentals. Let's start a bit from the beginning. Now, we know that 200 years ago, uh, David Ricardo, the economist, outlined the concept of comparative advantage. And it was, it was a simple concept, and it, the core idea behind comparative advantage is that it doesn't make any difference. Uh, let's take his example. He was talking about uh, Portugal and England, uh, where England would ex end up exporting cloth to Portugal in exchange for Portuguese wine. Now, the beauty of this theorem that he developed was that he explained why if the Portuguese and the English both end up with more cloth and more wine at the end of the trading process, it doesn't make any difference to either country what conditions the product was uh, produced under which it exported to the other country. In other words, the Br English don't have to care how the Portuguese wine was produced, what the labor cost of it was, and the English don't have to uh, English don't have to care about what uh, the conditions under which the Portuguese wine was produced, and the Portuguese don't have to care about the conditions under which the English cloth was produced. The what, uh, be, uh, they, they don't have to care, and that's a good thing because by not caring, they both countries end up with more cloth and more wine. Now that is, of course, just a textbook example, but it's a powerful lesson uh, for uh, countries that want to, their consumers to do well. If we want people to have lots of things to consume, then we want countries to export things in which they have uh, this comparative advantage and to import things in which they don't. Uh, so I, I must now immediately, uh, as I've already suggested, say that the question of this debate is wrong. The, the question asked here is whether free trade can be fair. The question, uh, that we should be asking is why anyone would oppose free trade are considered to be anything but fair. And if free trade is almost inherently fair all the time, I don't understand why we need a special kind of trade that we call fair unless in, in stamping the word fair on a coffee container, we get people to feel good about paying a higher price for it. Now, I'm the last to discourage people from paying higher prices from things for whatever reason they want. Uh, I imagine I pay higher prices for uh, certain uh, products because they have certain things on the label that appeal to me, and I don't expect to be criticized for that, nor sh should the people who print the appealing labels on the products be criticized for printing them there if they get me to buy the stuff. But you, you, it, is, it is inappropriate to confuse the labeling with the substance, about which I will say more in a moment. So let's expand on our thinking about what's fair. Uh, is it fair for me to buy a Chinese-made shirt from Walmart if I get a low price? If I get to buy it at a low price, and the Chinese worker uh, gets a higher wage because Walmart is buying Chinese shirts, is there anything unfair about that? 
Is there anything unfair of, for me to drink a cup of coffee that tastes good and that I get at a low price if the coffee grower who produced the coffee would be worse off without my business? I don't see what there's unfair about that, even if the coffee is not fairly traded coffee. Uh, I, would, I would like to uh, urge you to, uh, to consider the fact that opponents of free trade uh, fall into three categories. Uh, first category uh, it does not at all include our first speaker. Th this category consists of special pleaders like unions and businesses that use the existence of national boundaries as an excuse to keep out competition. Now that's one group of opponents, and we're not talking about those people tonight. Uh, a second group, which I think is, um, is more apt here, uh, is the, what I would consider to be altruists who push consumers into buying goods from local cartels, which I think we are talking about here, euphemistically call cooperatives all in the name of fair trade. And then there's the third group, uh, and that's the academics and anarchists who use the trade issue to breathe life into the corpse of Karl Marx. We're not talking about them tonight either. Uh, they like to condemn globalization. Uh, which is now the epithet of choice that the Marxists are using in order to keep their dogma alive. But I digress. Uh, in his book, Globalization, Don Boudreau wrote as follows. He said, globalization at bottom is merely the extension across national boundaries of the very same economic processes that inspire you to trade with the supermarket down the street and the physician across town. Exactly. The only reason that we have a conversation about protecting countries, countries adopting protectionist measures that keep out imports. The only reason we have that conversation is because the existence of national boundaries gives these three groups that I just identified an opportunity to, to uh, apply their trade or push their cause. That's the, only, that's the only sense of it. What difference does it make that there's a border between Mexico and the United States, uh, except that we may want to uh, regulate the inflow of people across that border, but certainly not the flow of goods across that border. Um, to, 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 uh, I would, I would further finally uh, ask you at some point to read the uh, 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 it was 18th century philosopher Friedrich Bastiat in his Petition of the Candlemakers, in which he proposed that we paint all the windows black, that we paint, every, we, we paint all the windows black because of the unfair competition that sunlight creates for the candlemakers. Th this is, the, uh, this is the, the, the way the word fair can be misused. In, in the lexicon of the, of the opponents of free trade, the word fair is unfair is used all the time to suggest that there's something unfair about a country buying goods at low prices, or in the case of taking advantage of the sunlight, getting uh, goods that are available free because of nature itself. The, uh, the, the concern I have in part then about the, uh, about the concept of fair traded goods is that the Word fair, unfair, as applied in the trade literature and in the public policy forum, is frequently a source of a lot of mischief. Now, wh why do we want free trade? Well, obviously, of course, so that we can have more goods than we would have without free trade, and that was Ricardo's point. Other reasons, uh, free trade puts competitive pressure on businesses and labor to sell at uh, competitive prices. It promotes economic development by opening up the markets of developed countries to underdeveloped countries. It makes it more costly for countries to get into fights with each other. Uh, th so those are sort of the standard textbook arguments for uh, free trade. Um, now, the obstacles to free trade are protectionist quotas and tariffs, anti-dumping laws, uh, where the, the, the anti-dumping laws have the curious role of keeping out stuff that's cheap. Uh, there, is, there is an instance in which the um, United States government decided that the only fish that could be called catfish and I get this from my colleague Jonathan Houghton, by the way. The only fish that could be legally called catfish are these fish that we all occasionally eat that are, flo flo that are swimming in U.S. rivers. And that's because the Vietnamese were farming catfish and s shipping them to the United States in large numbers. The Vietnamese were henceforth forced to give them a different name so that Americans wouldn't confuse the Vietnamese, I can't call them catfish, with the exact same commodity that was sold in the United States. And eventually, when the, that didn't stop the Vietnamese from exporting what they had to call, the, what, whatever they were call, then calling catfish, because that didn't stop them, the United States managed to, to put a stop to Vietnamese exports of catfish to us by enacting an anti-dumping procedure where it was discovered that the Vietnamese were unfairly and illegally selling the same catfish at a lower price to Americans than they were selling it to the people in Bangladesh. 
This is just supposed to be, this is just intended as an example of the kind of silliness and perniciousness that can result from opposition to free trade. But let me, let me raise my question now about fair traded coffee. What I understand um, uh, Rodney to have just told us is that what he does is he organizes cartels in countries that produce coffee and other commodities. I don't know how he manages to keep these cartels working because cartels have a habit of breaking down in a hurry, especially in a highly competitive market, uh, co highly competitive commodity markets. But I'm sure that he keeps it together in part by paying higher wages. And in economics, we have an expression for this. We call them efficiency wages, wages that you pay above market in order to cultivate worker loyalty. Uh, and, and there's an economic reason for that, not necessarily an altruistic reason for it. The part about this that I don't understand, uh, that I understand not to be fair, is that the, uh, this leaves all the other coffee growers out there in the market to fend for themselves. What must they do? They're not, going to, they're not going to convert to some other crop. We just heard about that. Well, what they do is they sell their coffee on the open market. Uh, is it unfair of me to buy the coffee from the person who doesn't get included in the cartel and doesn't get the above, uh, above market wage uh, when in fact if I didn't buy his coffee, I would be denying him an opportunity to make a sale to me? I don't think so. So I, I'm, going to, or I'm going to submit that the only problem we have here with this concept of fair traded goods is labeling. I think that if there were a federal trade commission that ruled over world trade, they might investigate this labeling as, as an unfair trade practice in the sense that it's, in my view, at least highly misleading. And we were afraid that these guys would find nothing to disagree about. <laughs> Let me put uh, uh, one or two questions uh, to you. I'll, I'll, I'll encroach on the audience time for about five minutes uh, before turning it over. Uh, David, let me begin with you. You said that, it, quoting the, the Ricardo example of the Portuguese wine and the, the, the English consumers, you said that it shouldn't make a difference under what circumstances products from another products that are imported from another country are produced. All that should matter is that they become available here and that in the course of trading back and forth, uh, the, the amount of goods available or, or money available on both sides gradually increases. I wonder how far you would push that. Uh, you say that it there should be no objection to your buying a shirt that says made in China simply because it was made in China. Um, I would agree with that. Uh, but somebody might come along and say the wages paid to the Chinese worker are, are so low as to be unconscionable. Uh, you might say, but they're good enough for him because it's better than he could get if he didn't uh, have the job. S push it to the extreme. If China had slave labor camps, which in fact it does, they're called Lao Gai, had slave labor camps in which prisoners were forced to produce goods uh, as slaves, and those goods were then sold in international markets, uh, would you still say, as a consumer on this side of the, the exchange, that it shouldn't make a difference under what circumstances goods were produced, as long as those goods can be imported into this country and bought by American consumers, everybody's better off? At that point, the question does acquire a moral dimension, and the, the test for me would be really simple. Do I help these poor people more by buying the shirt or not buying the shirt? What if I don't buy the shirt? What, what happens to them then? Do, are, they, are they stuck in a worse form of slave labor than they currently have? Uh, but I, I would also, of course, have to consider the fact that whether I buy the shirt or not has no impact uh, on the conditions under which they work, but sure. At that point, yes, I, I would have to agree there's a moral issue, but again, the issue isn't whether I can stop slave labor, the issue is whether I can improve their condition by not buying the shirt, which seems unlikely to me. So then how do you decide at what point you draw the line? At what point would you say circumstances under which something produced overseas and imported into this country uh, are, are so low, so, so derisory, so unacceptable by American standards of decency uh, that I simply have a moral obligation not to, not to participate in that. I would have to know the circumstances, but uh, I, I, I'm, I think you're having a hard time coming up with a realistic example that would engage any kind of moral judgment, frankly. Rodney, what do you say? Uh, I can provide that. <laughs> 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 so there's a, at, well, right now there, we are in our 10th year of trying to stamp out forced child slavery, well, of course forced, trying to stamp out child slavery in the cocoa industry. It has been uh, well researched. Ten years ago, the industry said, gee, even though we've been doing this for 100 years, we had no idea this was going on. And it has to do with just how 
so much, so many of our tropical commodities are characterized by a no holds barred uh, reality uh, that things that you might think are beyond the pale are in fact common. And so you have just in West Africa, source of 70% of the world's uh, cacao. Um, you have hundreds of thousands of children who are working in what are uh, widely agreed to be very undesirable conditions. And we're not talking about somebody working on the family farm. These are children working on other farms, often hundreds of miles from their home. Uh, at, at the worst cases, you have tens of thousands who are in a situation that can't be called anything but slavery, not paid, threatened with violence, uh, kept against their will. And so that being one of the more stark cases. So yes, you could buy this chocolate bar made with tainted cocoa and probably tainted sugar and what have you. Or it's like, okay, I'm going to buy chocolate. Somebody is going to get my sale. And it's like, oh, and here is a s fair trade supply chain. They've rooted out these problems. Um, more of the money is getting back to the community. There is not child slavery involved. I feel better you know, as, a, as, a, as a merchant and as a consumer, as a chocolate lover, I feel better about that. Have you, in fact, rooted out the problem, though? No, you, we you haven't. You said yeah. before, I can't remember if you said it before we came in or if you said it in your remarks here or yeah. both, that only about 5%. I think it was 5% of the okay. coffee that sold right. uh, uh, qualifies for the, the fair trade label. So how do you answer the question that David Turk put to you at the end of his remarks? What about the other 95%? You, you, are you not consigning them to work in the same horrible circumstances right. that, and, and, right, and that, that is say decent people should shun? Right. Um, and this is actually one of the places where fair traders appreciate the power of the markets um, and the copycat uh, dynamic of the market. First of all, we're going to buy coffee. We're going to buy chocolate. Somebody's going to get that sale. So it's just a question of, of where you direct that. Um, so it, it's false to say that, oh, if I don't buy this slave-produced product, that that's a bad thing because they'll be even worse off. They will have lost a sale. Um, somebody is not going to get a sale, and somebody will. And when you consciously say, I actually want to know more about where my products come from, I, I, th for me, there is a moral element to my commercial transactions. And I'm going to buy from the ethical merchant, from the ethical farm, what have you. Not only is your particular purchase free of those, those taints, but a powerful, for a powerful signal is sent to other actors in the market. And that is why, you know, not long ago, 0% of the world's coffee was sold on fair trade terms. And it has been growing by double digits uh, ever since. And now it's about 5%. That adds up to something like, Oh, we'll call it 300 million uh, pounds a year. And with the cacao industry, we've seen a very similar dynamic. The, the industry has dug in their heels, but now they've come around. Nestle is buying a little bit of fair trade cacao. Um, Cadbury, now owned by Kraft, has started to buy a, a substantial amount of fair trade cacao. So the point being that whatever the innovation is, it could be a new gadget, it could be an iPhone, it could be an ethical product can have this knock-on, this ripple effect in a market, raising the, the, the conduct of, uh, of, raising the level of conduct across the board, eventually. David, would you argue that in general, free market practices are most effective at doing exactly that, raising the conduct of players across the market? Well, sure, the, but I'm, I'm going to have to remind everybody again of what we're talking about here. You take a gr bunch of growers, organize them into a cartel, Pay them more because you presumably have a better product and, you're going and you want to pay them more perhaps out of altruism. You shift the higher cost onto the consumer by wrapping up the package in something called fair traded coffee and putting a nice label on it. And that's your business model. That's fine. But let's not delude ourselves into thinking this is going to change living conditions in underdeveloped countries. It's going to have no effect. 5%. What, where could this end? Are, we go, are, are the fair trade companies going to cartelize the entire coffee industry across all underdeveloped countries in such a way as to extract better terms for the workers? Of course not. The only, the only path to, to helping people working under these unhappy conditions is to keep the demand up for their product while the countries find their way to in, undergo economic development, which they do best if their trade with the United States is possible instead of being cut off by American trade barriers and quotas. That's the only solution. Otherwise, we're, doing, we're filling a market niche for consumers who feel good buying a product with a, something stamped on the label and, and no doubt, no doubt making life better for the handful of uh, producers who are lucky enough to get inducted into the cartel, but 
to some marginal extent at the expense of all the other producers. Nothing is going to happen here with this process to improve overall living conditions in these countries. Rodney, let me, let me ask you, just, to, just to, to follow up on this, you, you began by describing the horrible conditions under which uh, uh, coffee growers have traditionally operated or, or the, the, the mm -hmm. cacao growers in, in uh, uh, Africa. It seems to me that, w that what your real uh, nemes that, you, that the nemesis against which you're setting yourself up is not the free market, but precisely unfree markets. Right. So I wonder if, if there might be, uh, if there might be a reason to to object to what you're doing as being a sort of sideshow, not really getting at the fundamental issue, which is to make the markets freer, but rather singling out some small percentage of victims of the current unfree system, mm -hmm. trying to make their 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 lot better. They're mm -hmm. trying to improve improve their plight but not doing what I think David would argue uh, free trade policies generally can do, which is uh, gradually to wear down the, the, the restrictions that make markets unfree and increase the amount of freedom overall. Uh, those are very good points. Um, and there's a number of things I need to set the record straight on. But to your point uh, first, and that is I would say that it, not at all is it a sideshow, but rather a key part of fair trade, certainly as equal exchange practices it, is to shine a spotlight on the reality in these remote areas of Peru and the Ivory Coast and Thailand and, and so on. And that so Has it made a difference? Is there any? We have. A, and in the 25 years yeah. you've been doing this, is any, have any of these markets become what you would now call largely free, that used I, to be largely unfree? I would say th that they're better, uh, that it's an incremental process, especially when if you have a handful of volunteers starting in the 80s with a, an unorthodox business model with no backing uh, from the powers that be, not from governments, not from large financial interests, you, you have a handful of volunteers. We have now created a multi-billion dollar market and which is operating ethically, but more importantly is uh, raising awareness about, wait a minute, there's somebody behind that t-shirt. There's somebody behind this chocolate bar, behind this coffee. And so not only has the uh, officially uh, fair trade market been growing strongly, but it has had this effect where now, whereas once, well, like when we started, people said there's not a problem. Um, your model won't work and nobody cares. And now what we find is um, people are all agree, the, you know, the Nestle's and the Crafts and the Starbucks agree, that, oh, there's very much a problem. And people are competing with their own solutions about what to do about it. So there is, whether it's using the fair trade model or something else. Um, but one of the things I want to add is that, first of all, we don't organize cartels. Uh, we work with cooperatives. We don't organize the cooperatives either. They are self-organized. Um, and if you take all the world's cooperatives together, they are a substantial part of the world economy. They equal an employment, a total uh, number of employees greater than Fortune 500. Um, and they are, they're organized because they work. Say that last point again. Um, if you take all the employees of the world's cooperatives. Uh, Not just the ones you do business with. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the farmer they, call, they, yeah. They add up to something larger than the, the entire the workforce of the of the Fortune 500. 500. Um, in the United States alone, the cooperative sector, and this includes Land Lakes, Organic Valley, Associated Press, REI, True Value, Ace Hardware, these are all for-profit cooperatives, well not all are for-profit, but they're all cooperatives, and they represent about $500 billion in economic activity. Their viables are substantial, um, and uh, we are working with cooperatives, uh, in this case of small farmers, in about uh, 25 countries around the world, and they're organized because th they need to. Um, th actually, the first group of farmers to sell fair trade coffee was a, a cooperative in Oaxaca. And when they first got founded, because they were changing like the facts on the ground, the reality there in a coffee growing region of Mexico, one of their leaders was killed, but they kept organizing. And then another leader was killed. Over 10 years, over 25 of their leaders were assassinated and uh, until finally the powers that be, the merchants, the people who were doing really well with the coffee market, finally gave up and said, okay, you, you can have your cooperative. Uh, let me ask uh, David to respond to that. And while he does, to invite members of the audience with questions to, to line up behind the, the microphone over here, uh, please just uh, get up and line up behind the mic. David, uh, uh, take a, a last response, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Yeah, the, um, th this is what I would urge you to do when you go to the store and you see the fair traded item and have a good feeling about that because of some of the points that we've heard here. And then remind yourself that uh, economic prosperity has absolutely nothing to do with what people say people should be paid. Nothing to do with that at all. What, it, what is, where does prosperity come from? It comes from capital formation, technological progress, having in place a robust legal system, 
and uh, a, a principled form of government that allows people to engage in economic activity without worrying about corruption and crime. Without those ingredients, nothing changes. It's all talk. So, so yes, and good for those few farmers that get to join the, excuse me, cooperative. I wanted to call it a cartel. I still think it's one. Uh, good for them, but uh, it's a, uh, a pinprick in the ocean of depression that, that, uh, that these countries suffer from. Uh, I'm mixing my metaphors. But the point is clear. Uh, you don't get economic progress by getting consumers to feel good about what they buy. Okay, let's open this up to the audience. Um, Miss, first question, please. Hi, thank you both. Um, so I have a question for each of you. Um, my first question is a little briefer, and it's for Rodney. The other one is a little more extended, and it's for the chairman. Um, so for Rodney, um, how exactly do you make money? <laughs> uh, the way that uh, most companies uh, do, so we are buying these products, we roast them, package them, we do the sales, customer service. Obviously, we charge more, we, we sell it for more than what we bought, mm -hmm. uh, and we try to maintain a, a modest profitability between roughly around 2% a year, and it, it's worked uh, very well. Uh, so yeah, we are a, a consumer packaged goods company. We're selling coffee, tea, chocolate, bananas, and... Uh, so yeah, w we're buying at one price, we, we add value in various ways, uh, we sell that. But one of the things that we do differently is that we found that there's a lot of profit here in the U.S. coffee industry. And we found that we could just take less for ourselves and pass on more to these cooperatives and to their members while still being competitive in the marketplace. And one reason it's worked is, in fact, we don't charge more for our products. And often, if you, we're in the specialty range, so you know, it's like Pete's coffee, Starbucks coffee, that quality level, and that often our prices are lower. So we're not asking consumers to pay more. Um, and uh, so with this high quality product, with uh, this powerful story, uh, with the increasing interest that people have in how their, their goods and services get to them, uh, we have found this resonance in the market. Uh, we don't we spend very little on marketing, uh, partly because we want to get more to the farmers, but also because we don't have to, because these stories tend to tell themselves, which allows us, without a big marketing budget, to remain competitive in the marketplace. Okay, understood. Thank you. Um, and a question for the chairman. Um, so I'm sort of a believer in free markets myself, and I agreed with a lot of what you said um, about free markets. Um, but I also think that Rodney is sort of on the same page, I think, with free markets and the fact that he, um, his group is voluntary, there's no co coercion. And I think, you know, you look at the textbooks and free, free trade is, is free when it's actually free. So when the, the principles of no coercion apply universally. Does, I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you say that in order for a free market to be free, there's got to be, you know, um, no coercion anywhere. So, and what he was saying was that these farmers are subject to coercion and subject to, you know, land being taken away from them and, and forced into, into labor. So it, th that basically breaks the pr all the principles of, of free market economics right there. Well, we have to separate the, the moral issue from the question of what free market economics means. And it, it, what, what I mean by the advantages of free trade is very simple. Can we have more goods if we buy the stuff abroad rather than try to produce it ourselves, period. That's the question. And that's not a trivial question. That's a really important question, m perhaps the most important question for underdeveloped countries which are trying to improve their standard of living. The, the, the moral question of what the, co the, the conditions under which the stuff is produced is completely separate from this. I w Bastiat was suggesting that we don't want to keep out the sunlight because there might be exploited gnomes working on the sun, waving lanterns around in order to light up our living rooms. Uh, who cares why the sunlight is free? It's free. We don't ask moral questions about where it comes from. And we, don't have to, and, 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 and we probably don't have to ask moral questions, particularly about where the coffee comes from, and, and I'll tell you why, and that's because if we kept out the coffee, these workers who are already exploited would suffer more. But that's a separate question. The, the question that free trade tries to answer is how do we get the most goods? And the answer is you buy it at the lowest price wherever you can get it. Right, so okay. So Irrespective so of the reason. Right, so, so Even if there's a monopoly or coercion or whatever's going on in the other country. Uh, no, I understand. So, so taking out the question of morality, but I don't think economics is based on, the concept of free market economics is not based on morality. I think it only works where, when there are players who are free to, to, to make voluntary decisions. 
right? And, and so these laborers don't, aren't able to make a voluntary decision. So they're not subject to, to, to free market principles. I would vehemently de deny that the free market, the argument for free markets is not based on morality. I think it's based on a highly moral principle, which is that people get as many goods as they possibly can despite the efforts of special pleaders eh, to stand in the way of their getting those goods. That's what I would, that's, that's the moral principle. But I'm, I think I'm keeping other people from asking questions. So I, I, I may so be repeating myself. <laughs> Okay, so other people are being kept from getting goods. So, so, so what he's doing is standing in the way of other people's morale. Like basically, other people are being unfairly treated because of be they're not getting the goods I don't that think they Rodney's want. Okay, tre treating anybody unfairly at all. I just don't <laughs> think that what he's doing rep represents anything particularly fair. I don't think fairness is the issue. I don't see it. I don't understand why, why there's a fairness uh, happening here. Mm -hmm. That's all. Okay, it's a business model. I see your point. Yep. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Next question, please. Hi, this is for uh, Mr. North. Um, one concern I have with the idea of fair trade is if we increase the price received for coffee, uh, but only a certain number of the suppliers will get that fair trade contract, doesn't that pose the risk of drawing new suppliers in who then sort of reduce the, the price for non-fair trade coffee uh, and leave them potentially in a worse situation, potentially leave more people in a worse situation than, than before? Yeah, um, we, we run into this all the time, and we don't find any uh, price signaling signaling dynamic where, okay, so roughly, let's say, the world's uh, coffee uh, growers uh, add up to 20 people. About one of them is getting the, the fair trade price, or it's more like there's two people, and they're getting the fair trade price for half of their coffee. Um, for, for the other 19 people, any if they grow any more coffee, they're going to get that same bad uh, conventional market price. Um, the existence of a fair trade price for somebody doesn't touch them, doesn't affect their uh, decision-making calculus, because they're not going to get that fair trade price. What, what, and, and what I'm saying is yes. for the people already in the market, but mm -hmm. doesn't this potential uh, profit uh, in excess <laughs> of normal profits for some coffee producers uh, potentially uh, attract more competitors that increase that number from 20 to 21. No, because again, so remember there's like there's two prices in the market. There's yeah. the conventional price, which generally is a subsistence poverty price. People can't, they don't make enough to change their circumstances. And then for a few of us, we're saying, look, even though I know I could pay you know dirt low prices, I'm just not going to. Yeah. Uh, I don't need to. I have enough money to get by. Uh, so for the for the coffee for my business, I'm going to pay a better price. And one of the interesting things is this is where free and fair trade uh, actually can reinforce each other. Is that one of the ideas about the, one of the things that makes free trade and free markets work is the ability to switch. And one of the things we have found in 25 years is that you have millions and millions of people living clo so close to the bone, they don't have the luxury of making switches. They don't have the resources that are necessary to improve their human capital. Um, and by contrast, when they do get a little more, it, the suddenly, okay, they can do things like they can improve the quality of their product. They can invest in their children. They can invest in the human capital. Uh, I remember I was talking to this uh, cacao farmer in Peru, and, and they were just s for the first time selling uh, their cacao on a fair trade basis, and we we're asking, what are you going to do uh, with the extra income? Uh, and, and just in general, what are your long-term plans? And that was for my children not to be farmers. Um, as it was, they had, they had sunk cost. They had farms. Um, they lived in an area where there's no other viable economic activity. They had knowledge about how to farm. And even though it paid very poorly, there, there, there wasn't a way to get out of it. With a little bit more money, they could hire teachers, build classrooms, send the kids, say, to a vocational school, what have you. And so um, by giving them a little breathing room, we've, we've seen this time and again with farmers around the world, that then the market could do its thing. People could say, you know what? Like, like when I grew up, I want to be a, a dentist, or, or you know, m more more likely uh, an accountant. Uh, you know, some um, a profession they can get with a high school or you know a couple years of college education. And with with the conventional market where they were getting a, a dirt poor way price year after year, they had no choice but just to keep h hanging in there doing the same old thing, uh, even though it was working very badly for them. 
This question's for Mr. North. Um, I'm just a little skeptical, I guess, of um, how you're able to ensure that the producers that you're buying from are acting ethically in the way that somebody buying your coffee would feel good about. Yeah. Um, it would seem to me that if you were doing a lot to make sure that the coffee you bought was ethically produced, you would have to spend a lot of money um, investigating the people that you bought from to make sure that they're hold they're going to the high standards that you that we would all want them to produce at. So I think that the I think people do care about where they get their goods mm -hmm. um, and where like how ethically the goods are produced. But I think it would be very expensive to make sure that the goods are produced in a in an ethical manner. And so I'm slightly skeptical of how you're able to do that and still deliver prices that are competitive with people that do not think about think much about how the the goods are produced. And so I'm concerned that the people see your coffee and they think it's an easy fix to, to buy free traded coffee because as Mr. Turk said, it's labeled as being, you know, fair trade. Somebody looked at this. And I just wonder how closely you're looking and if you're looking closely, how able you're how you're able to charge such low prices. Yeah. Uh, first of all, we have not found the the inspection cost. Uh, to be uh, actually that high at all. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for this. For one thing, okay, there's a certification system. Many products have different kinds of certification, uh, whether it's organic, um, it's, whether it's a fishing method or what have you, whether it's, a, it's how paper is produced and how the forest uh, was, was tended. And the, the short version would be that, no, we haven't found that the cost of verifying the information to be that high. Um, Partly because there are many, there's now hundreds of companies like ourselves around the world who are doing this, and the cost can be actually a lot of it is shared or is borne by the uh, the coffee companies. But um, <coughs> we only need all of us are using the same ins inspection services. It isn't that every company has to go down and, and sort of reinvent the wheel and send armies of um, of auditors. Mm -hmm. um, some of the auditing mechanisms can ride piggyback or very are very similar to already existing audit, auditing systems for the um, for the, like organic certification. Uh, another important part is the nature of the cooperative model. So you have these businesses, the farmer co-ops, that are owned and governed by the farmers. They exist for the farmers' uh, benefit, and the farmers themselves are keeping an eye on it. Um, and there's also again this market dynamic. If any of them were to uh, to uh, basically break the rules, um, it endangers the viability, it endangers the business for everybody else. So you have a self-policing mechanism. Break the rules by doing what? Uh, like for example, using uh, child labor on their farms, or you know, using forced child labor, um, or like let's say uh, I'm a member of the farmer co-op and I'm selling my coffee, and on the sly I'm buying coffee from somebody else who's like not a member of the cooperative and I try to pass it off as mine that would be breaking the rules and doing something like that could lose the fair trade eligibility for the whole cooperative and so they have a vested interest a commercial interest in making sure watching each other is so there any advantage to any farmer in not taking part in in what you're offering and if and, and assuming that there's no advantage yeah. to, to not getting the higher price, right. why aren't you besieged by the 95% who want in well, on the deal? We are. They, they knock on our doors all the time. But what, we, how, how do you yeah. tell them no? What do you say uh, to them? Well, and, and, and how was what how we and, and what I, I'm yeah. curious. So how do you say no in a fair way? Sure. <laughs> well, one of the things we work with the same cooperatives as much as possible year in and year out. This is one of the ways through a constant dialogue we can help them improve their quality because they get to know us, we get to know them. And, and improving your quality of a product like coffee takes years, and it's usually done through uh, small incremental steps. Um, if you do business sort of like with a series of one night stands, there's not a lot of learning going on. But through, through a relationship, you can have that. Now, th I wish my students could hear this because I, they could then write an essay on the definition of a cartel. Now, this is the problem that cartels face uh, it consists of outsiders trying to sell into the cartel or sell to customers uh, at a lower price, thus disrupting the efforts of the cartel to maintain its monopoly. That's exactly what we're getting here. Uh, it, what about this poor farmer that wants to sell his stuff but is kept from doing it because of the rules of the, of the cooperative? That's fair to keep him from selling his stuff. 
Okay, that's yeah. fair. That's what you're paying for when you buy the fair trade coffee. I don't understand the, 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 moral, the morality of this whole process. I, I still don't understand it. Maybe I can be convinced. Yeah. I encourage people to go check out www.ncba.coop. That's the National Cooperative Business Association. And it explains how cooperatives work. And one of the things that distinguishes a cooperative from a cartel is by nature it has to have open membership. If, like a farmer in that community has to be allowed to join if they want to join. Uh, that, so there'd be that. Also, I just wanted to mention, because I know we're not going to be able to get to all the questions, um, and I know a lot of people want to know, does fair trade work? How does it work? You know, what have been the ups and downs? So I brought these books. Um, it, fair trade has been studied, you know, to the nth degree by armies of uh, professors and academics and journalists and others, um, and, you know, people who specialize in international aid and development. Um, a lot of the research is right here. I also printed out extra copies of a study about the efficacy of fair trade. So, um, well, for 10 lucky people, you can grab a copy and take it with you. The rest of you have to write down the title. Doesn't sound fair to me. <laughs> <laughs> next, next question, please. Uh, one of the uh, United States' leading comparative advantages is a massive military, uh, which, it <coughs> excuse me, uses, of course, to dominate much of the rest of the world and uphold fascist dictators like Rios Montt and uh, uh, Somoza and uh, Pinochet and many others in Latin America, but not limited to that, of course. Uh, the Pentagon itself has a massive R&D budget uh, subsidized by the public, which then goes into private profit corporations' uh, patents, which themselves are protected. And, of course, the United States is the world's leading uh, supplier and dealer in arms, etc. So until we have a much more moral foreign policy, uh, you're right. We can't expect, certainly, that uh, fair trade is going to change everything, even though it's a very good idea in its own right. It has to be coupled uh, with a massive change in American foreign policy throughout the world, too, doesn't it? If you're asking me, I thank God that we have a massive military. I would make it bigger and stronger and <coughs> more active and more successful in, in keeping our enemies from killing us. But that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but not from us from killing them, I presume. That's okay, huh? Killing our enemies is a good idea. I'm yeah, what makes them their enemies? Uh, because you declare them so or because well, they I dare think to think challenge us in our uh, hegemony throughout the world? You asked oh, that's your idea of morality? Yeah. Just like consuming is all that yeah. morality all right, let's, amounts? Let's, let's keep well, it focused on, on issues of trade. Sure. So, um, I have a question for the professor. Thank you both for being here. Thank you especially for doing this last minute. I'm impressed and also like uh, appreciate your style, as I assume many of us do. Um, this is a question for the... Uh, Sorry, I'm a little short. Um, <coughs> this is a question for the professor about um, related to the textbook world that you described, which is a world without tariffs and protection. It was a really interesting world. I, I know, as far as I know, it exists only in textbooks. <laughs> and I'm curious about this world. Um, but I'm curious about it because in the real world I live in, protection and tariffs um, create a world that is unequal. And, and the fair trade world that I assume you aspire to create through your. Free trade. Th sorry, th <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, the, the, the free trade world, I, I misspoke, the free trade world that you aspire to, to, to have for us, um, as far as I know, do not, doesn't only not exist now, but probably will never exist, is in my opinion, because it's in national best interest. I'll get to this in a, in, okay. in a second. It's in national best interest to provide those protections. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, the world that we do live in has, um, has things like corn subsidies, for example, that have caused massive illegal immigration from areas like Chiapas, Mexico, where when we dump corn there through a fair trade agreement like NAFTA, we actually cause illegal immigrants to come here. And so I'm curious about what's fair about dumping you know, subsidized corn, what's fair about a world in which tariffs and protectionist measures will always exist as far as we can tell. First of all, um, I, I didn't know about these subsidies, but they make no sense to me. Uh, uh, yeah, so I, I would I exclude fully, them yeah. from, from any policy recommendation I would ever make. And, but, but my argument is you don't want to make the, perf the uh, perfect the enemy of the good. The United States doesn't have to care what other countries are doing. We don't have to enter into regional trade agreements or engage in multilateralism. We are the greatest country in the world, and we can, uh, we can proceed, we can o operate, demonstrate our, excuse me, our greatness. I need some more unfair coffee. <laughs> we, can, we can demonstrate our greatness by unilaterally eliminating all barriers to trade and benefit from it. We don't have to wait for the rest of the world to straighten itself out. That's the beauty of the argument. Right, and, and in the meantime, get rid of silly policies like the one you're describing. I, I guess I'm concerned that the world you're describing is still theoretical. And no, so no, 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 there's yeah. nothing theoretical about unilaterally getting rid of all of our trade barriers. 
Just do it. Do, do is, really is there any country that has done well, I don't what you're know, describing? Right. Do you actually see that happening any time in the next well, 3,000 years? Well, maybe not, but that's because yeah. people don't listen to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if we all listen to you, the world would be much better. So. I think so. Can, can, let me, um, just, just to follow up on that question, let me ask both of you. Is the international market in general, in coffee, in, mm -hmm. in, in whatever you want to focus on, uh, generally speaking, getting freer? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say that... Um, I mean, We'll just say yes. I mean, if you look at the, the GATT and then the influence of the WTO, the admission of, of China to really the, the globalized economy, you look at a U.S. Uh, trade policy you know, with, uh, regarding textiles or, or what have you, that uh, consistently the barriers, whether they're tariff barriers or non-tariff barriers, have been dropping over time. David, do you think that it's a problem that so often trade is described as though it's a military endeavor? Um, sure. You, it 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 it, it often strikes me that it's difficult for uh, for people to approach it and not to think that it must be a, a, an area in which there are winners and losers when it's so often described as us versus them, one country country A versus country B. Uh, so that if you were to you know adopt, uh, I, I you know, suppose you could call it the unilateral disarmament that you were describing before, no tariffs, no barriers, uh, nothing at all. How long do you think it would be before participants on both sides of a market would see improvements that would make that kind of disarmament worthwhile? Well, what we would do is we'd get more products at lower prices. Uh, how long it would take for that to happen would just depend on how long it took consumers to figure out that they could have more cars. So why is, the, why is the resistance to doing that so strong? Well, because the, uh, because the benefits of free trade are diffused over the vast population and the benefits of protectionism are concentrated in politically powerful lobbies. Why, why, why has Obama taken forever to get a free trade group going with, agreement going with Colombia? Because he owes the, the unions his election. That's why, and the unions are against free trade. He's, he's, uh, he, it took him forever to decide to have a free trade agreement with South Korea for the same reason. The unions are a powerful voting bloc. The unions don't like free trade because it puts competitive pressure on their wages. Now, th so that the, the, the beneficiaries of protectionist measures are, are small in number but concentrated, and they have a lot of money to throw at the political system. Rodney, let me ask you the, the reverse yeah. of that question. You've emphasized that what you do is, is voluntary, that what you're talking about is voluntary action. Yeah. Is there anything that you think ought to be written into public policy, ought to be made mandatory uh, in order to ensure, you know, quote unquote, fairness in international trade? Mm -hmm. Sure, there'd be a or, or would you yeah. agree with, with what David Turk says about right. eliminate all barriers to trade and, and the benefits will be th the greatest imaginable? Well, I understand the, the, the economic argument for, um, that for unilateral uh, disarmament, so to, so to speak. Um, but what I won't go there because I'm not a professional economist. Um, but as a, we call it a, a peace offering, uh, one thing I, I would offer to David is something I'm sure we'd agree on, and that would be to look at the U.S. trade policy on sugar, which I think is highly distorted. The U.S. sugar market is one of the most distorted agricultural markets, certainly in the country, maybe uh, in the world. Um, and it's actually because of people like the billionaire family, the Fan Jewels in Cuba. I mean, these are Cuban Americans in Florida. Um, and you know they are very wealthy donors to both parties, and so b because of uh, their way of working the system, 85% um, of the sugar consumed in the country has to be grown in the country, and the the farmers we work with, like in Paraguay or that we might sugar cane growers we might work with in El Salvador, they're frozen out, and you know so people who already have a lot have more, and the people who might benefit from access to a market are excluded to it. So there, I think the fair thing would be freer trade. Also, Absolutely. The, same, the same thing with peanuts and cotton. This is the moral argument for free trade, uh, an illustration of it. Of course, it makes no sense on moral or economic grounds to, to allow American sugar producers to monopolize the, the American market. Of course yeah. not. And what it's done is it's chased some manufacturers into Canada that don't have uh, quotas on, on sugar imports. Mm -hmm. Lifesavers, for example, as I understand it, moved out of Michigan mm -hmm. and went to Canada because of the uh, fact that the Canadians don't have these ridiculous quotas. Mm -hmm. So before we run out of time, yes. let's, let's take a couple more questions from the but audience. I, I think this gentleman, based on the Equal Exchange logo on his vest, might, <laughs> might, he might let me have another 
might have another 30 seconds. Well, let him get let him get his question me. first, then you yeah. can. You well, because I, I never actually answered your question, which is like, what, what might be one thing that we would write? Uh, one thing would just be more transparency across the board about how goods and services are, are produced. Um, but the other thing, and this would be sort of more sort of jousting, is if we're going to free up. There goes the peace offering. Yeah. If we're, if we're going to. That's besides the pound of coffee he gave him in the. Yeah. 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 Is that if we're going to have uh, free movement of uh, goods, services, capital, intellectual uh, property, that it's not really a free market if you don't also free up the movement of labor. Because uh, if, if, some, if some factors of production can move and others are stuck in one place, that those factors that can move are going to be at a market advantage to those, i.e. people, that can't move Now, this is a misconception. Borders. One of the great advantages of free trade is you get the goods without getting the people. And if you, want, if you think that we should uh, have some limits on immigration in the United States, that's the best way to go about it. We get the goods, the Mexicans get higher wages, but we don't have to have the people, which I'm, I'm not opposed to letting Mexicans come in the United States, of course, as long as they get in line behind everybody else. The, but if we're going to have any kind of immigration policy that limits access to the United States, then free trade is an, is an alternative to open borders, which I think is a, a very good alternative and a uh, successful one. Sir. Hi. Um, you owe me, Rodney. Um, I just wanted to make a comment, actually. I've been trying to formulate it as a question. I'm having difficulty doing that. And you can comment back, or b either of you can. Um, fair trade alone doesn't work. You're right. Uh, we're, it, there's, there's issues of scalability. There's all the kinds of issues that you've been talking about. But fair trade didn't grow up as a bunch of nice altruistic people in the North throwing a few extra bucks towards the farmers in the South. It grew up as part of social movements in s largely in Central and South America. The formation of small farmer co co cooperatives, cooperatives, small farmer cooperatives, freely associated, you can join or leave. Um, and the price is only part of what the fair trade is about. The other parts are access to credit, the other parts are uh, long-term relationship. We just had 15 years with one co-op, and I think we go back 20 years with other co-op. And um, it's really helping a group of farmers to build an institution that uh, gives them some economic power together. I guess I do have a question. I'm curious to know what's the difference between that cooperative free association of members and a, a joint stock company. And is a joint stock company necessarily a cartel? I think I have to say that I'm not sure. Uh, the, what, I, what I do, what I am sure of is that the uh, ability of the um, cooperative to succeed depends on keeping non-members from selling into the, into the cooperative as we just heard. And it, uh, it, it requires coordination among the members, which, is, uh, which sounds to me very much and is, in fact, the way cartels have to work. I, I, by the way, I think this these formation of these cartels is completely benign. I, I, if they're able to survive economically through Rodney's e uh, model, business model, then that's fine with me. Again, I'm only going to su insist that this has nothing to do with fairness because by definition, by necessity, the farmers that don't get to play don't don't have the, the special advantages that are offered to this group of farmers, and they are selling on the world market at the at the market price. So they don't get included. Indian companies that can't compete with a more efficient company. Oh, well, that's in other words, too bad for these other farmers, huh? I'm not saying that. I'm well, not it that sounds like it. <laughs> sounds okay. like you're saying that, which I think strips away the whole concept of fairness. So I'll just uh, reiterate that cooperatives by their nature must let in members uh, on an equal basis. They, they can't block out people. They are by definition, and again, go check out ncba.coop, uh, they are by definition not cartels. They, they don't um, sort of draw a circle around themselves, and around themselves and say, okay, you can't join. So uh, a two-part question, and I have to preface by saying I am not an economist. I can barely count past five. So if I get some of the terminology or sort of concepts. Well, we are in the law school, so maybe you're in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially true. Um, so the part of the question directed towards you, Mr. North, is I'm hoping you can give me a sense of what the ultimate goal, the long-term, big-picture goal of fair trade is. Because in my mind, 
if it stays what I sort of consider to be um, right now, kind of a branding initiative. It's a type of goods that because of the way they're made, you can sell to a, a certain niche of American consumers mm -hmm. because it's packaged the right way. That probably doesn't have the long-term goal of fundamentally altering the international trade market. But my assumption is that um, fair trade will affect what types of markets are considered free because trade with countries in which there are an incredibly limited number of incredibly powerful producers of goods um, and vastly disparate wealth um, and access to wealth will eventually become either failed states or become areas where we actually can't trade anymore. The places where there are no producers of a product because of domestic turbulence eventually become not only not fair, but not even trading partners. Um, and my question for you is, what's the sort of end goal of fair trade? Mm -hmm. And then my question to the chairman is, what do we see then in the international community or in the world between sort of having to have a certain set level of production standards or qualifications um, in order for there to even be free trade in the first place? If we can't reach a country because it's in civil war or under ma major strife, we can't trade with them anymore. What are the, the sort of linkages between those two things? So the... The, the big picture, the, the, the ultimate vision, would be to infuse markets with morality. And, and we're not going to dictate what that morality is. Um, like Gandhi, I, who, he had a way of, of, well, he was advocating a way of behavior that would basically bring out the best in the other person, uh, whatever that is. And we at Equal Exchange have a basic faith in human nature that it's uh, fundamentally good. Um, we see a lot of badness and exploitation, the abuse of power out there, uh, but we think that people are basically good. And that, yeah, the, the ultimate thing of fair trade is not to, you know, to have another 100 million pounds of coffee bought at a certain price, uh, but rather it is to say, hey, you know, we are connected with each other all around the world, and not just overseas. We're of course, we're con connected with the people who pick our lettuce or, you know, who clean up our hotel rooms and what have you. And that that, is, that relationship, by necessity, has to have a moral element. That it's not enough to put our faith in the market to make everything work out right. Um, uh, markets are very good at bringing down prices, um, there is an undeniable uh, efficiency of sorts to the market, but I think it has to be, um, uh, um, to that we have to add the, the moral component. And we can't make moral choices without information. We need to know, you know, was child labor used to make this t-shirt or, or this chocolate? And even with our relatively small size now, I would say that we and other like efforts in other industries and by other companies are already having this effect where every year just the total sort of volume of conversation about this the amount of in initiatives the amount of products the amount of um, the conversation which is actually happening in tens of thousands of churches here around the united states is growing and growing and i who knows how far it can go but i think it's going in the right direction we're, we're running out of time and i want to make sure that our, our, our last question or patiently waiting gets a chance to ask but um, dr turk let me just ask you on this point that, that Rodney North makes, moral arguments can be very powerful. They can have a very strong influence on, on public behavior, on consumer behavior, on mm. public policy. When you're speaking to that public, in other words, not to the economic seminar making strictly economic arguments, how do you convey the idea that the moral ends that are being sought by those making the moral arguments can in fact be more effectively achieved by the, the, the pure free market policy it's, that you're asking? It's simple. The, the, the child that's making the t-shirt can make the t-shirt and make a, 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 a poor wage or the child can, or the t-shirt factory can shut down and the child can go into prostitution. It's very simple. It's a simple moral argument. Do you want the kid working in the t-shirt factory or do you want the kid out on the street selling herself? Which do you want? I don't have any problem making that moral argument in favor of free trade, but uh, I think we should let our last question. But couldn't they go to school too? <laughs> What, what, again, what, where, where do you want the kid? You want, him, you want the kid in the factory or out on the street? Uh, they could be in the school too. I, uh, how, how, uh, you should ask your question. All right. yeah, uh, so it is clear to me that we can never have true free trade without um, freeing our democracies of um, donations by unions to po politicians and corporations. 
because, you know, farmers in Kansas, you know, they're going to, Monsanto, they're going to want to s perpetuate the corn subsidies. They want to perpetuate these unfair markets. So it has seemed like a, th we can never have a free trade um, situation. And I still can't understand your defense that we can't uh, leave out the moral question out of our trade decisions. I don't understand why we can't see the immorality in turning our trade policy over to, uh, to unions that are operating only in their interest and to the disadvantage of the vast American, peop vast, vast American population as well as people with whom we might trade. I don't understand why we would defend their ability to stop us from having free trade with Colombia on the basis of narrow protectionist interests. Why would we defend that? And if, if the moral argument is against the unions and if the economic argument is in favor of free trade, what's stopping us? Uh, big money, donations. Well, I know, but, but we don't have to put up with it. As always, we've run out of time before we've <laughs> run out of questions and interest. So I, I will thank all of you for, for being here. My special thanks to, uh, uh, to, uh, to David Turk for <laughs> stepping in at the last minute, to Rodney Lord for coming. And the elegant and effervescent Jennifer Bonardi, Executive Director of the Ford Hall Forum. All right, how about another big hand for our great speakers and our moderator, Jeff Jacoby. <laughs> That's right. Free. Free. Studies are free. Um, if you're not already a member of the forum, please become one. There's information at the info booth. I think we had a meetup group here tonight, and if we did, uh, fantastic. Please come again. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great night.